Great. Well, hello and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Ellis, Alberta's Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. I'm pleased to be here with my uh, colleague, uh, Tyler Shandro, the uh, Minister of Justice and Solicitor General, uh, and uh, to be joined by Chief Information and Technology Officer uh, Ron Anderson of the Edmonton uh, Police Service. So uh, thank you uh, to the Edmonton Police Service for hosting us here today. Uh, the Edmonton Police Service continues to be an important uh, partner in helping us address uh, some of the biggest health and safety issues facing the city. Uh, it doesn't seem that long ago I was here to announce uh, provincial funding uh, for the Human Centered Engagement and Liaison Partnership Unit, better known as the HELP teams. Uh, the teams are uh, doing a lot in the community, especially for people struggling with addiction and mental health issues, and I I've heard some very, very positive results of the work that they've been doing. And it's not long after that we announced that uh, police would play an essential role in offering addiction treatment uh, to people in cells, uh, a, a first in Canada. Anyone who's arrested for any reason now has an option to access evidence-based uh, opioid addiction treatment uh, right in the police cells through the Virtual Opioid Dependency Program, an award-winning program. We've taken these steps in partnership with EPS because uh, we know that the police must be an integral part of the recovery-oriented system of care that we are building. Our government is focused on uh, treating mental health and addiction as a health care issue while keeping our community safe. We don't need to choose between the two. Every jurisdiction in Western world uh, that has uh, built a comprehensive system of care has included police at the center of the process. And that's why we're here today taking another step towards uh, recovery for Albertans experiencing addiction and mental health challenges. Ensuring that we have effective uh, mental health supports, working in collaboration with uh, police creates stronger and safer communities. Police officers are often the first to respond to mental health emergencies and for good reason, when safety is often the primary concern. As a former police officer myself, I've experienced firsthand uh, just how difficult some of those calls can be. As I know, without a doubt, that equipping police, uh, pardon me, equipping police officers with the right supports can make a big difference, uh, both of them and for the uh, police in that crisis. Today, I'm proud to announce that uh, Alberta's government is providing an additional $1.6 million to move forward with provincial implementation of the Health IM. Health IM is an innovative digital tool that will support law enforcement, officers to better assess what help a person needs and to take appropriate action. The Health IM system will enhance safety, uh, promote uh, evidence-based uh, decision-making, uh, improve communication between law enforcement and health services, and lead to better outcomes for Albertans. Health IM is a program that is uh, loaded onto an officer's mobile device and provides them with information they need to better assess the needs of a person experiencing mental health emergency. Mr. Anderson will provide, of course, more specifics on the Health IM system momentarily. Implement implementation of the Health IM will begin this July with EPS right here in Edmonton. Then we'll look uh, to roll out the Health IM to other areas of the province in a phased approach over the rest of the year. This is but uh, one step in our approach to treat addiction and mental health as a health care issue while keeping communities safe. We don't need to choose between the two. Our government is building a comprehensive recovery-oriented system of care that gives every Albertan an opportunity to pursue recovery. In Budget 2022, we increased the provincial addiction and mental health budget by $60 million over the next three years. This is in addition to the $140 million increase over four years that was committed during the last election. And since elected in 2019, we've increased addiction and mental health budget within Alberta Health by 117% province-wide. We found efficiencies to consolidate the 211 system so that Albertans struggling with their mental health can call 211 and find support that they need. We've added more than 8,000 newly funded addiction treatment spaces, more than 2,500 in the Edmonton area alone. We will soon be opening a new 100 bed uh, recovery community to provide long term addiction treatment that will service Edmonton. We've eliminated daily user fees for Albertans accessing publicly funded treatment. No one should have to stop paying their bills or sell their house or to take on crushing debt just to access life-saving treatment. And on the other hand, nobody should be forced to live in chronic homelessness in a perpetual state of drug abuse because they can't access health care. 
We've made it easier to pursue recovery by increasing access to the virtual opioid dependency program and to create low barrier division. This means that anyone in Alberta can now get, an, uh, get on demand access to evidence-based medications through this program same day with no wait lists and of course no user fees. Uh, we've introduced the medication gap coverage program and began funding the injectable oat medication sublocate. Sublocate uh, lasts in a person system for 30 days, providing stabilization, reducing cravings and significantly enhancing uh, protection against overdose. We've also taken steps to expand services that reduce harm, uh, introduce the Digital Overdose Response System, or DOORS app, while continuing to fund and expand supervised consumption site services in the Edmonton area. There, and there's a lot more that we've been doing to improve outcomes for Albertans struggling with mental illness and addiction. The Alberta model of recovery-oriented care relies on everyone, including uh, police uh, coming together to change people's lives. First responders, community service providers, and those who work the boots on the ground to make the difference for people with addiction and mental health challenges. So thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you for all of your support, Albertans, and thank you to the Albertans who are in their pursuit of recovery. I'd like to now welcome my friend, Minister uh, Tyler Shandro, to say a few words. And as well, thank you for reviewing the um, um, thoroughly the, the, the further investments, uh, substantial further investments that the government has been making when it comes to mental health and addiction here in Edmonton. Uh, as the Minister of Justice and Solicitor General, I have a great respect for Alberta's law enforcement professionals. We call on them to respond not just to crime and law enforcement issues, but to a variety of other social issues, and that includes addiction and mental health. They've risen to the occasion time and time again and deserve all of our appreciation. It's important to recognize that police are not mental health professionals and may not be the best equipped to handle mental health emergencies or crises. People who are in the middle of a mental health crisis present some of the most unpredictable situations that a police officer may face. And these situations require far different tactics, far different approaches, than those involving criminals. And mishandling a situation like that can result in tragedy. And that's why it's important for police to have access to as much information about the individuals in question before they respond to a crisis. By providing details of the individual's weapons history, uh, details of any past encounters with police, particular psychological triggers, the Health IM platform can not only help police peacefully de-escalate a situation, but also determine whether they should convey the individual to a designated facility or if they would better serve um, their, their needs to connect them with community mental health resources. And it's uh, an invaluable tool that we hope will lead to better outcomes for law enforcement here in Alberta, who will have more time then to focus on crime and law enforcement issues and for vulnerable Alber Albertans who will be less likely to have an already difficult es uh, episode to escalate into something even more traumatizing and stigmatizing for them. And I'm very pleased that the Ministry of Health will continue to provide Health IM with stable, reliable funding. And I look forward to seeing this tool becoming a routine part of how our province responds to mental health emergencies. So thank you very much for allowing me to come and speak today. I'll now ask Chief Officer Anderson uh, to come up and say a few words. Come on. Thank you, Minister. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Edmonton Police Service, thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's truly fitting that we are gathered in the Wichita Inn building for this announcement. Uh, this building is home to many EPS units, including our Human Center Liaison Partnership Unit, along with our police and crisis teams who directly collaborate with partners such as the Alberta Health Services and the Government of Alberta to provide the appropriate support services to our community members. These partnership teams will greatly benefit from this technology and so will the public. Innovation is one of the pillars of the EPS to build a safer city. Health IM will allow us to use a science-based health perspective to provide compassionate policing to our citizens experiencing a mental health crisis. 
I'm thrilled to see our policing counterparts throughout Alberta will now be able to join us in this partnership to ensure our citizens' health and well-being are prioritized. The information police officers have access to prior to arriving on scene better prepares them for what will be an encounter, knowing the history and possible triggers that an individual has can help our frontline members de-escalate a situation and prevent unnecessary contact for the individual with the criminal justice system. We're honoured to be the first police service in Alberta to utilize a Health IM mobile application to deliver an empathetic, evidence-based approach to emergency mental health crisis. Thank you very much. And I believe I'm passing it to Eric. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. So we're going to go uh, to the Q&A portion of the press conference here. So we're going to start. Uh, we've got, uh, I believe, one in person, uh, maybe a couple others joining as well. And then we'll go to the phones. Just a reminder to reporters, one question, one follow-up. Please state your name and outlet for the record uh, and who your question is addressed to. So we'll go to the mic here uh, for Joe first. Hey, there's uh, Joe from uh, CTV. Uh, this is for questions for uh, Minister Shandro. Um, just want to have a quick question on the uh, meeting with uh, the mayor that uh, just wrapped up, um, and on the uh, the police act. Why now? If but, you know, we've heard this has been a there have been concerns about the violent crime in the the, the downtown, especially uh, Chinatown, for quite a while. So why uh, take this uh, this measure now? Well, first, uh, you asked about the the meeting with his worship. Um, it was a, a productive meeting. Uh, it was a lengthy meeting. It went over time. It was a great opportunity for us to be able to to sit down and uh, actually listen. And this kind of goes to your second question, which is, uh, you know, why now? We were listening to all the work that the city manager and the, the mayor were telling us are being now done by uh, by Edmonton. Um, it was great to to hear uh, an overview of of what they're going to be submitting to us and uh, for us to be able to answer any questions. It was also a great opportunity for, because uh, I was joined by, by Minister Ellis and Minister Lawan, for them to talk about the, um, the, the important uh, in, and significant investments that have been made in mental health and addiction and in housing in Edmonton in particular. And, and a point that Minister Lawan had made is, uh, he, was, he was talking about a, a pyramid of supports. And the very core, the very foundation of these supports has to be law enforcement. And uh, the conversation that I heard him and uh, the mayor talking about that we have to begin in getting law enforcement right before we can now start to talk about other supports that many in, in, in the vulnerable community here in Edmonton are going to need. And uh, that was great to hear that conversation. And then for me to be able to answer any questions that uh, the city manager and, and the mayor had before they, they can take the next steps in, in providing us with their submission. Uh, where were the, the disagreements there that uh, you know, you're hoping to see in, uh, in the, the plan that uh, that the, the mayor will be outlining, I believe it's next week. I, sorry, what were the disagreements? So, yeah, were there any, you know, the, are the you guys meeting? on the, were, were you not on the same page about uh, certain uh, certain topics? I, I think we're on the same page. It was, as I said, we, we got an overview from the city manager on, on some of the work that they're, they're going to be outlining for us that will be in that community safety plan. And I look forward to that submission. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, we'll go to our next uh, question at the mic here. <laughs> Hi, Minister. A question for you as well. Um, speaking with some political watchers, they were saying that it was a, a bit of an interesting move for the letter to be sent to Edmonton when some other cities, uh, similar Calgary, are having uh, some similar issues on their LRT system and some dangerous incidents there. Um, with the mayor saying that, you know, Edmonton has the best funded police uh, force across Canada, I guess sort of what was the... Um, the, I don't want to say motive, but, you know, the reason for sending it to Edmonton specifically, or do you have plans to work with other cities as well? Well, I think, uh, so first of all, our, our office is going to continue to review and, and um, look at crime statistics in, in various different parts of the province, as we always will. Um, and I think that it's clear that the situation in Edmonton um, does appear on the face of it compared to other cities in, in the province to be quite different. Um, that the, the situation in Edmonton has deteriorated, in particular in the last couple months. Um, you know, we felt that action uh, needed to be taken and needed to be immediate for us to, to be able to use the full force and effect of the Police Act to be able to um, have the benefit of bringing all parties to the table, working together. 
uh, putting discipline to, to the work that, that needs to be done for, for the, the safety of all Edmontonians to be addressed. Um, and I, I think that was outlined for me when I, I sat down and, and met with the mayor and, and the city manager talking about, you know, there has been work that's been done in Edmonton, but using the Police Act to be, bring all parties together and to, to being able to bring some discipline to, to that work. Um, I also think that, um, you know, and, and this is a, an opinion that I have, I understand from the Department of Justice that they, they share this opinion with me, that uh, we have greater insight uh, as, as does the, the public into the, the safety planning that's being done by Calgary City Council, as well as the, the Calgary Police Commission and the Calgary Police Service. Um, I've, I've followed developments in Calgary very carefully, um, and uh, I've also uh, seen through various media reports that uh, there is a, a transit safety plan that's being developed, and it's in the works. I also understand that CPS, the Calgary Police Service, is, uh, is going to be presenting to Calgary City Council fairly soon on violent crime. I'm looking forward to being able to, to see that presentation. But finally, when I'm asked this question, it, it appears to me that the relationship that Calgary Police Service has with their administration is a, a good working relationship with that administration. So for all of those reasons, we thought it was, it was um, necessary for us to take these steps now and why it's, it's steps that we haven't taken with other municipalities. Thanks. And did you have a follow up? Yes. Um, with regards, obviously, this is early stages in this and they are going to present a plan. Uh, but given the meeting that you had with Mayor Sohi, do you anticipate um, having to increase provincial funding to achieve uh, some of these joint goals? Well, um, I, I think what we first have to do is see the submission that they're going to be providing to us. Um, that was... Um, um, not something that was necessarily raised uh, at the, the meeting today, but if, if that is part of the submission that comes from uh, the City of Edmonton, I'm happy to, to get that advice from them. Um, I think that a lot of steps can, can be, I mean, you just said that Calgary or Edmonton City Council is claiming that they're the best funded police system in, in the uh, service in the, in the country. I mean, if that's the case, then I don't think this is about money. This is about us making sure that parties are working together, bring some discipline to the work that everybody's doing, and getting people on the, on the same page and making sure that, that how resources are deployed within the city uh, of Edmonton are addressing, in particular, the violent crime increases that we see in the transit system and in Chinatown. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. And we're going to uh, go to the phones and then we'll be back uh, here for another question. So if uh, operator, you can please put through the first caller. Hello, Theron, Global News. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. This is for Minister Ellis, please. I'm wondering if you can provide your reaction to British Columbia's decision to um, become the first province uh, to receive an exemption under the Controlled Drug Substances Act um, to remove criminal, sorry, criminal penalties for possession of some hard drugs. Just a reaction from you, please. My reaction... Um I guess my reaction would be there's no evidence uh, to support that that is an effective uh, policy. Um, I am extremely uh, disappointed. Um, why the federal government uh, would, you know, this, I mean, this is a cultural shift when you do, when you do something like this. There was no, there was no engagement with the, um, with the citizens of Canada. Uh, I'm not aware of any engagement with uh, the people of British Columbia. I mean, this sort of thing is, is an absolutely a, a cultural shift. And if you talk about, and I've spoken this before, when you talk about places such as Portugal, as an example, that went forward with, the, with decriminalization, as an example, there was extensive consultation with the citizens of Portugal. Like, this was not something that was done through the stroke of the pen. Um, I question, you know, um, you know is, this, is this something, why did the federal government not bring this up at the ballot box? I've concluded my remarks. Thank you. Thanks. And Eloise, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, just along those, those same lines, I suppose, uh, why would Alberta or any other province maybe need to be consulted? And is this ever something that, that could be discussed um, for our province? Well, I, uh, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, as the... Um, uh, Solicitor General of the province, I have concerns with m many of our small urban and, and rural communities that border with uh, British Columbia. 
Uh, this is potentially going to increase a buyer's market. There's going to be, um, I think, um, it's going to be a significant impact on our bordering communities, and uh, I think that should be a concern for all Albertans. Uh, so that, that's one. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you, Eloise. Thanks. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Michelle Belfontaine, CBC. Oh, hi. This is a, a question for Minister Shandro. I guess I, I really want to go back to um, your decision to invoke the Police Act last week. Um, to get Edmonton to present a public safety plan to you. I'm just wondering, I mean, wouldn't, couldn't you have just picked up the phone and called them? Like, wh why, why such an aggressive tactic when uh, you could just give them a call? Well, um, I think if the, the, the city of Edmonton is talking about all the work that they are doing right now, um, and for us to, to bring some discipline to that work, bringing all parties to the table. I, I disagree that uh, there's anything aggressive in, in using Section 30 of the Police Act to, to being able to um, address concerns that Edmontonians have and, and working with all parties to, to being able to make sure that the, there is a, a community safety plan in, in the city and to being able to, to work with all those involved and in, in making sure that Edmontonians get what they deserve, uh, a city that they can walk around in and, uh, and enjoy. Uh, in in the in, in safety and and rather a threat of violence. Thanks. And did you have a follow up? Um, well, yes. I, I, I mean, I mean, how is it not aggressive though? Did, did you think to call the mayor and, and the city manager to say, hey, you know, we're hearing about some of the stuff that's happening right now. Um, can we talk about this? Did you try that first before deciding to invoke the police act? Our concerns were that looking at the, the statistics here in Edmonton, that the, um, the situation, as I said earlier, had deteriorated very quickly in a matter of just a few months. And it was necessary for us to, to work immediately in being able to address the, the concerns uh, that all Edmontonians have uh, to making sure that their, their city is a safe one. Thanks so much. And we've got time for two more questions. So we're going to do one more from the phones and then one more in person here. So if operator, you can please put through our last question on the phones. Tran, Global News. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is in regards to what was announced today. Um, regarding this announcement, um, I just have a question. Many people of color don't feel safe calling police during a mental health emergency. So I was wondering, how does the province plan to address this gap? Specifically regarding the, the health I am, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start off by, by seeing if, if Ron has, has any comments, then, then talking a little bit about what we are as a province doing when it comes to um, hate-related uh, violence in, in the, uh, the province. But I'll, I'll start and see Ron. Thanks for the question. I think the, the, the first thing I'll say is the vast majority of incidents that we attend from the police perspective where there's a, an individual with a mental health situation taking place aren't necessarily called to us as a mental health call. Uh, so we take a lot of different calls for disturbances. We take calls with trouble with persons. We take calls for various violent occurrences, etc. that may have a mental health application to them besides just those individual mental health calls for service. This tool isn't just designed to be used in a situation where we receive a purely mental health call. It's designed to be used in any situation where the officer or if it's a PAC team, etc., or a help unit can employ that risk-based tool set that's based on the interi mental health screener to make the appropriate decision of what to do with the individual to connect them to the care they need or if there's a crime that's taken place to address that as well as the mental health related items. So it isn't uh, purely about just mental health calls, it's about any call for service. Uh, and most often the calls that we get around mental health cars aren't the individual who's in the crisis calling us in the first place. It's somebody else who's observed that situation. Thank you, Ron. And I'm just talking a little bit about, you know, the, the safety of, um, of, uh, of people of color in, in, in the province and concerns that they might have when it comes to, to hate crimes. Um, one of the reasons why this province has um, announced a health or hate crimes coordination unit within the ministry to work with our police services. There's also hate crimes liaison to be able to work with communities uh, where, where people of color are getting giving our police officers that and police services that feedback. 
I think uh, we also see from the speech from the throne, uh, we've announced that we will be looking for opportunities to working with communities to being able to appoint a special advisor to work with us and, and look at ways in which we can uh, further respond as a province to uh, addressing hate crimes in the, uh, the province. So thank you. Thanks, and did you have a follow-up there? Um, I do. Um, throughout the presser, um, you have emphasized that um, law enforcement has to be at the forefront of this issue. But across, like, over the past few years, many people have died after police have attended to mental health emergencies. So how do you plan to make sure this doesn't happen in the province? Well, uh, from from the EPS's perspective, well, for our, our, our perspective, I think this is an incred incredibly important part of the, the answer is is providing these types of tools like Health IM. So as we said throughout the announcement that our police officers who are attending a mental health uh, crisis um, have the information that they need to be able to respond. And as I, I said during the announcement, I mean, when, when somebody um, is, is responding to a mental health call, um, mishandling a, a situation like that can result in tragedy. And so that's why we need to make sure that our frontline officers, when they do come to one of those calls, are, um, are, are equipped with all the information that they need. Uh, Ron, anything further you would want to add to that? I would just add, this, this tool brings uh, additional information to the officer at the time they're responding about what was successful the last time this individual was dealt with. So most times when we deal with a mental health situation, it's almost like we're going to the same fresh call again. Uh, in this case with Health IM, we know what the risk factors were the last time. We know what the de-escalation points that were successful the last time. So we can employ those same strategies again and avoid those types of situations you're referring to. Thanks so much. And we're going to go to our last question in person here. Hi, thank you. Uh, Lauren Boothby with Edmonton Journal. Um, some critics, uh, Minister Shandro, have called invoking the police act an overreach and they've also criticized why are you uh, making this demand of city council when it's the police commission that is supposed to direct how police are funded so can you just address some of those criticisms and maybe why you didn't reach out to the police and ask them why they're not doing things differently or the police commission well sure um, so first of all I, I would disagree that it's an overreach uh, completely I think what we um, <laughs> Um, I think what we, we see with what's happening right now in, in, in Edmonton and getting the feedback from Edmontonians um, that it, I, I think we, and, and even in particular, the, the work that when we, we listen to Edmonton City Council last week and listen to the work that we hear Edmonton City Council is, is now working on, um, that there's a great opportunity for us to bring some discipline to that, that work, make sure that all the parties are at the table. Um, and we, we've heard from Edmonton City Council saying that they would like to, to see the, the province um, being involved in, in um, the answers here. So we're, we've said to, to City Council, we're happy to, to be able to get a submission from you on a community safety plan, um, making sure that Edmontonians will have their concerns addressed with that plan and that City Council, their police commission, can work with Edmonton Police Service to make sure the resources are deployed in, in a way that can address the increases in violent crime in the city. All right, and um, when we spoke to the mayor after the meeting, he mentioned there's some things that the city can do, maybe there's some things the province can do to improve safety in Edmonton. So what are things that you want um, the city to do to increase safety? Um, does that include police funding? What does that include? And what are things that you're bringing to the table that we want to change? Do, can you give some specifics? Well, no, not yet now because, and I, I would want to wait till I got the submission from uh, the uh, from City Council. So I'd, um, I'm looking forward. I got a little bit of an overview today on what they will be submitting, and um, and was able to answer questions that they had before they could, you know, provide their submission. So happy to have that opportunity to sit down with them, um, and uh, answer any questions that they had, so that they can feel comfortable in submitting a uh, a plan to us. And then once we get that, that plan, and I understand there will also be, in, before they submit, working with our deputy ministers and in, in justice and solicitor general, but also in health and community and social services, to making sure that when they do have a submission, that it's, um, it's going to involve all the feedback that our three ministries are, are going to, to have for them in this, in this submission. So did you propose anything to change yourself? Like, what, what is the Alberta government going to do to improve safety in Edmonton? 
Well, first, as I, I said, we're going to want to get the submission from Edmonton City Council. If there are concerns that we have with their submission and if they have suggestions for us, I'm happy to get those submissions from Edmonton City Council, but I don't want to um, uh, preempt what they might be submitting to us. Thanks, everyone, and that concludes our press conference.